Hello there, Thrill Seekers. For today's Friday flashback video, I'm presenting a video shot on August 27th, 2009 in Helsinki, Finland. And in this video, I'm talking about Nishijima Roshi's different sort of interpretation of the Four Noble Truths. So the Four Noble Truths is very foundational stuff in Buddhism, and I'll talk about it in the video you're about to see, but basically the normal version is all life is suffering, the cause of suffering is desire, uh, cutting off of desire is the way to end suffering, and uh, the Eightfold Noble Path, Noble Eightfold Path of ethical action is how to cut off desire and therefore suffering. That's the usual way, and my teacher Nishijima Roshi had a very different way of interpreting it, and I talk about this fairly often, or actually I should say I used to talk about this a lot in the past, but I don't talk about it so much anymore, so I thought this video was kind of good to give you a basic idea of where, where I'm coming from, I guess, what my teacher said about this basic Buddhist stuff and how it's a bit different from the usual interpretation. So let's take a look at me in Helsinki, Finland in the summer of 2009 talking about the Four Noble Truths. Usually the first noble truth is given as all life is suffering. But actually the word that's used, it's translated as suffering, is a word called dukkha. A word the word dukkha. And dukkha means more like unsatisfactory experience rather than suffering. And then the rest of it, uh, the, the thing that's translated as desire is tirshnam, which is more like thirst. But my teacher, Nishima Roshi, has an even more radical way of interpreting the four noble truths, which, which goes like this. Uh, the first noble truth is, let's just for provisional sake, we say all life is suffering. He calls that the truth of idealism. So, as far as ideals are concerned, all life is suffering because nothing ever lives up to what you imagine it ought to be. The second noble truth is the cause of, of, of suffering is desire. And actually, the uh, Kushu Metsudo, the, the formula that's given in Chinese, which is derived from the, the Sanskrit and the Pali, uh, Shu is actually a assemblage. So, so the second noble truth is the, is the truth of materialism. So Tertia or desire uh, has, uh, in, in Nishijima's way of thinking, is two <coughs> meanings. One is, is uh, assembly. Um, Shu is, is, means assemblage or combination or, or um, what's the word? The piling up of things, you know, uh, which he interprets as meaning the, the way the material world is the uh, coming together of atoms and molecules and smaller particles. And also, Tirshin is like the desire for more, more material substance. So that's materialism. The, the third noble truth is uh, usually the cutting off of desire is the cutting off of, of suffering. But that's Kushu Metsudo. Metsu just means destruction. And he interprets that to mean real action at the present moment. So the third noble truth is action at the present moment. And the fourth noble truth is what they call the Eightfold Noble, uh, the Noble Eightfold Path. Everything is noble, uh, which, which is a sort of a, a form of moral behavior that is supposed to lead you to the, uh, lead you to the ending of design. And Nishijima Roshi takes that as, as being reality itself. So, so reality itself is not matter, and it's not spirit. It comes together as action, but, but we need a name for that whole, for, for when we take everything together as a single unit, and he calls that reality. So he likes to give it in a, a he likes to talk about Western history, which he sees as being key. He's, he's very interesting for a Japanese person because he kind of uh, negates Japanese history as being really relevant to the to world history, and he talks in terms usually of European and um, 
later American history. But if we look at the, the historical stream, uh, we in the West were following a path of spirituality and idealism for hundreds or thousands of years, with, with a few exceptions here or, there, here or there, but for the most part, people were very concerned with going to church and becoming more religious and pious. And, and that was considered the, the, the criteria of life. Uh, you know, even though you were shoveling dirt or whatever you were doing, uh, there was this very strong spiritual basis. But the spiritual, but becoming more and more spiritual didn't seem to make anybody happier. And long about the Renaissance, there comes the discovery of, of science, which is something that the Greeks have discovered and sort of disappeared and then reemerged in the rest of the Renaissance. And science was a materialistic philosophy that seemed like, okay, well maybe if this spirituality didn't answer everything, this materialism will answer everything. But as society progressed, materialism also lost a lot of its appeal because we saw that materialism could, and science, could produce electric light bulbs and computers and really fast trains and buildings that don't collapse. And, and, and airplanes and all kinds of cool stuff, CDs. Um, uh, so, uh, but uh, but it also produced atomic bombs and concentration camps and, and horrible things that uh, that were not making people happy and, and pollution and over over consumption and all kinds of other stuff. So by the end of the 19th century, really, uh, materialism lost most of its appeal. And uh, certainly by the middle of the 20th century, I think a lot of us became kind of not satisfied. Of course, there's a certain group of people who are going to follow materialism to the end of the world. But I think most, as, as a sort of a general rule, materialism has kind of shown itself to be not working. So we're in this, you know, by the 20th century, we're in this sort of like quandary of what to do. And a lot of people try to go back to spirituality. The problem with going back to spirituality is we already know too much uh, about science and about the material world. So, so you can't really go back to believing that, you know, apologies to anybody who does, you know, God created the world in seven days from, from and made out of sand and whatever else. Um, it's difficult for anybody to really accept that. So, so we're looking for, for a new criteria. What Nishima also always likes to talk about is, is the criteria of, of action. Action itself is being a criteria. So action is, there's sort of two sides to, the, to a human being. One is the sort of spiritual side and one is the material side. But those sides are not exclusive to each other. We just keep, we, we, for some reason, our brains can only focus on one aspect at a time. It seems to be a limitation of the human brain that we, we think, of, we think in, in idealistic terms or we think in material terms. And material also thinking in this case includes like um, the brain's processing of the sense of perception. So it's not exactly the same as thinking. So, uh, so action itself becomes a criteria, and, and a lot of our philosophies are starting to recognize that, like existentialism and, and pragmatism being the two that I know of that are really sort of recognized that. But they don't have a practice. And the thing that, that Zen sort of has to offer, or Buddhism in general has to offer, is a sort of practice, which is this. Uh, Meditation practice. You know, if, do you, do you know that? I, I found out in Japan they don't understand that gesture. So a friend of mine was saying, How come in Austin Powers they keep going like this? You know, <laughs> I had to explain the air, you know, the quotation lines in the air uh, thing. And then she started doing that all the time. <laughs> uh, so, so, uh, so, so it has this meditation practice which can, can help kind of bring the philosophy of action better focus and with enough work can kind of put you in contact with, you're never out of contact with reality, but we sometimes 
get it. Does this thing look really weird over here? <laughs> so I keep thinking I must look like a Martian. Antenna or something. 